Uh, welcome everyone to the sixth public meeting of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy Making. We have, have two speakers, uh, Daniel Goroff, who's a Vice President and Program Director at the Sloan Foundation, and Lars Vilhuber from Cornell University. Um, so my understanding, Danny, is that you're going to talk about uh, some emerging concepts and techniques for minimizing the risk and maximizing the benefits of analyzing data sets that contain private information. And <coughs> Lars, I understand you're going to talk about confidentiality protection and physical safeguards for data access and, and release. Thank you for having me over uh, to talk about some of my experiences here as well. I probably have the same disclaimer that other people have. I speak for myself and for nobody else who gave me money or wants to give me money or anything like that. Um, and to some extent, what I will be talking about are experiences that I've had in terms of access to microdata, both observing and actually going through some of the procedures themselves. It's going to be about the physical safeguards or sometimes the absence thereof, um, as well as somewhat the historical, legal, and cultural background that I'll emphasize very summarily. So uh, the basic trade-off that we're talking about here is uh, the, the tension between, and we've heard it multiple times, I'm going to be very quick here, publishing raw microdata is not an option, tabulations don't provide enough, um, there's some privacy loss involved in all of that, and the traditional solution has been, for researchers anyway, to sort of provide some mechanism to create public use microdata. And for some, for a variety of reasons that you've heard a lot about, that is no longer considered sufficient. And I bring up the public use microdata because what ultimately we're going to try and do is, for researchers anyway, to provide an easy and convenient access to data that has more detail than what we've been used to in the past, so coming from the already published information, but that has less privacy loss than direct publication of the raw data through whatever mechanism we want to think that. The public use data uh, paradigm is important because there's a whole set of generations of researchers that have grown up with a facility of having public use data that they just can have on their own. So the normal conversation with a researcher will always be, oh, I'm going to download the data, I, I have the data on my laptop, something like that. And that's, that's an important context because once we get to confidential data, we want to put the researcher to some secure environment. We typically have put them into some closed room. And then we can ask questions about what type of room that is, what type of access device we're going to use, what type of person is sitting in that room, who do we actually let into the room, Where's the data? Um, and ultimately, how do we get the results back out of the room? Okay. And the old style way of doing this, and I'm saying old style in the sense that this is what we did in the 1980s and 1990s, is that we would still have a room. We'd lock the user into that. We'd send the data over there so the data is in the room. And we call that room a data enclave or a secure room. Okay. What we're going to talk about today is is essentially making things virtual. And, and this has been ongoing practice for a while. It, what happens when the data provider retains the data, it doesn't ship it anywhere, and provides some sort of access to the user to sort of uh, do something with the data. And Alexander has pointed out there's several ways of doing this. For instance, uh, this can be with secure enclaves or things like that. And we will call this a virtual data enclave. It's virtual because the data no longer is in the enclave where the researcher sits. And you'll find synonyms out there uh, when you hear VDI, thin clients, remote desktop, that's what we're talking about in this kind of context. So the physical data enclaves was the method primarily used back in the 90s, say, to send around confidential data. Uh, you had uh, headquarters access at a variety of, of uh, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, et cetera. The Census Bureau RDCs, when at the very start, were physical data enclaves that took receipt of the data and provided to the researcher within the secure facility that somebody had to walk into. Uh, the Canadian RDCs created the initial ones created around the same time, and they were um, innovative for their time. In 2017, things have changed a bit, and virtualization has sort of gone through. The federal statistical RDCs now, back then the census RDCs, were some of the first to go virtual in the early 2000s. So there has not been a data file sitting in the actual census RDC since the early 2000s. It's been virtual ever since. The data never leaves the Census Bureau facilities in Bowie, Maryland. 
RDC systems out there in the world, in France and Germany that I'm familiar with, never actually had the mechanism of going into actual physical enclaves uh, in, as a broad network. They started out virtual right from the start. And uh, I'll, I'll briefly point out that this may be critical to the way of thinking about the type of access that they provide uh, these days. And there's a couple of, of university-based mechanisms as well. I was involved with the original setup of the Cornell CRABC, NORC, some of you may be aware of as well, provide this as a service both for um, uh, research files and, and other things. So the basic levers that this, these systems have is the where and how that researchers can access the data. So at the limit, there's no controls whatsoever. A researcher can access the data however they want. And at the other extreme uh, is you put it under some sort of FARP knock style security. I'm actually told that that's almost what the Bureau of Justice Statistics system looks like. Or you can, uh, you've seen this device in the presentation on the UK system. This is uh, a, a Scottish RDC, uh, roll it in and do something with it. Or in the case of the French system, you're just gonna be sitting in a university office but accessing the data through a dedicated device. And so all of these uh, methods have one thing in common is that they um, try to provide an easy to use system while retaining a privacy loss that is limited. And in fact, they all have approximately the same type of privacy loss because they all approximately use the same type of disclosure avoidance techniques, uh, mostly, as Alexander pointed out earlier, mostly heuristics or ad hoc systems. Um, so there is a lot of variation across the many systems in terms of what type of room they have. So um, this is not an exhaustive uh, survey, but you will have seen presentations from some of the Europeans on this before, and I just want to focus here in this particular slide on what type of rooms these are. So in the case of the French system, um, there is, uh, the only restrictions really are that you be in a university office. Now that poses the problem, who's actually affiliated with the university, what is a university, what is an officially designated university, and you can relax that even more, say, in the statistics Denmark system that you heard about, where there is no control of the room other than it be your university office, it's some sort of device, it may even be your home office, and so the access to their confidential data is quite liberal. In the American case, the FSRDC system, the entity that is providing the data, in this case the Census Bureau, has full control over those facilities. You don't enter the room unless you have a Census Bureau badge, not a university badge or anything like that. That is sort of the other extreme of it. Okay, so control of the room and what type of facility you're sitting in when you access data is one of the key things that vary across these different systems. As it turns out, results leaving the room, otherwise called disclosure avoidance, is actually quite homogeneous. But let me just sort of think about the fact that what typically happens here is a researcher asks an authorized agent of the data to say this is okay and then to send it out. What if we radically said that authorized agent is the researcher themselves? These are the good guys, so why wouldn't they be able to do this kind of thing? And this would allow the researcher to control the flow of data going out, conditional on the rules that the agency might implement on this kind of thing. And it's actually something that we do when uh, we've got survey data that might be sort of of the confidential sort, and you get HRS or NLSY data, and these are the rules, apply them, construct the tables this way, and you're gonna say, good, fine. This seems radical for the administrative data, um, and it could actually apply to any of these systems as well. And it is actually what is done in Denmark, okay? One of those systems where the access rules about where you can sit and what kind of access device you have is very liberal in the sense that it actually allows the researcher to control the flow of results out, following the rules, but self-identifying themselves with those rules. Does that seem radical? We actually have a system like that for researchers right now in the United States. It's what Census Bureau researchers do. They're subject to the same kind of access. You can work at home as a census researcher, and you have a lot of liberty in terms of releasing the data according to rules that are then verified occasionally and done like that. So that begs the question, why do we allow some users to access this and not others? So we can look at two things. We can look at penalties and we look at uh, some of the culture that surrounds it. So in terms of penalties, there actually are no differences between an FSRDC researcher and a, and a census uh, employee. They face a prison fine, they, uh, they, they face a prison sentence, they face a fine. And that's actually similar, say, in France. But if you go to the German or French data, there are actually no prison, uh, the Danish data, there are actually no prison sentences. There are some minor financial penalties. There is, in particular, a loss of access to the data for the researcher, and what I argue, uh, more importantly, for the institution as well, right? And of note, 
In the case of the United States RDC system, of uh, the federal statistical RDC system anyway, the contract explicitly excludes university responsibility for that. Now there's still um, uh, federal wide assurances and IRB rules, but it's explicitly excluded. So um, one question one could look at is, does the ease of application of penalties and rules actually matter in terms of if it's easy to access or not? The other question is, who do we allow to be in there? And the key point here is that there is a distinct difference that I have observed in training of people who go into these data centers uh, and, and the kind of access that we ultimately, the ult alternate conditions we apply to them. And um, for, say, since we are employees, this is one or two days of literal at headquarters on site training. In the French case, that is actually the case as well. Every researcher who access this device in their own university office still has to go to the central statistical agency and go sit through a full day of training. And um, I would say that that is an important point. One last caveat, though, when we're talking about virtual enclaves, we are typically also talking about centralization. And just to highlight what that means for the FSRDC, um, if you look at the compute power of the entire FSRDC and you compare it to other federally funded uh, resources such as Exceed, we're orders of magnitude below that, and that is a constraint in terms of making that. Um, so just to sort of, what do we, we need to do to sort of go from our present system to a scalable larger system? We can ask ourselves, do we need to change some of the legal framework or the contractual framework with which we allow access to the data? Uh, how do we build a culture of responsible uh, and self-managed access by researchers so that the culture of protecting the data becomes intrinsic to the way they think about it? And do we th think that better controls or less controls about the type of device that are out there, are they actually critical for ensuring secure access to the data, or is the final firewall really the minds of the people who access the data? And I'll stop there. Thank you.